1994. I was 14 that year. I had acne. I was on the United Interscholastic League. And the boys at my school would rather throw gum in my hair than ask me out. So obviously I was a huge nerd. I was also, at 14, predictably super horny. I desperately craved sexual entertainment, but there was none to be found in my modest household. I mean, this was back in the day when it took five minutes to load a pornographic snapshot via dial-up internet. And, uh, you know, my family's computer happened to be in the most public room in the house, aka the family dining room. What was a sexually frustrated teen like myself to do? I was also a huge fan of the X Files. In the week between new episodes, I trolled the internet for any scrap of trivia I could find about my favorite show, and it was during one of those searches that I happened upon fan fiction. Yeah. Anonymous fans just like me wrote stories starring Mulder, Scully, and all my other favorite characters. And the more I read, the more that I discovered, but most of those fans were just as horny as I was. I spent hours, days, weeks, scrolling endlessly through pages of text in my masturbatory quest, all while my family went about their business all around me, completely <laughs> ignorant of my activities. At first, the relationship fiction involving Scully and Mulder falling in love was enough for me. But the more I read, the more I wanted to read of the moment when Mulder would look past Scully's calm and skeptical demeanor, rip off her pantsuit, and fuck her passionately. <laughs> Even more exciting were stories about how Mulder gazed at Skinner's bald and serious forehead and felt deep stirrings within. It wasn't long before I found out about Slash Fiction. Now, Fiction is not slash fiction. The slash subset is usually inspired by a little bit of ho oh, yay in the source material. Now, when I started writing fan fiction, it was 1987. I was 13. We had no internet then. This was the Dark Ages people. And I didn't even know that fan fiction had a name. But that did not stop me from writing just shit tons of daydreamy adolescent romance about <laughs> Wesley Crusher. Yes, thank you. Building this pool now, people. And uh, you know, and there was this thinly disguised self insert who was the youngest officer in Starfleet. Uh, well, okay, so sometime in college, I found out that this whole like writing about your favorite TV show, movie, whatever had a name, and then I also discovered Slash. But even though my fanfic output continued and thank God improved, it was a long time before I actually wrote any Slash of my own. So, a few years back, to crack up a friend, I wrote a piece of porn without a plot about uh, that fine old British TV show, Doctor Who. Now, you can tell it was a joke, because it wasn't about my favorite Doctor Who slash pairing of choice, which is right here, the Doctor and his arch enemy, the Master. Uh, no. No, what I wrote about was a story about uh, the third Doctor and Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart. Are there any Doctor Who fans in the audience? Uh, thank you, so you know what I'm talking about. Now, I wrote this thing about them working out in the gym and then getting it on spectacularly in the shower with, like, bench-pressing erotic tension and wanking and blowjobs and jokes about stiff upper lips. And this is the most popular piece of fan fiction I have ever written. Which goes to show you that what the fangirls really, really love is the sexy, sexy ho oh, yay. Jack Harkness licked his throat and ground against him behind the Aspidistra's 
And you know that really happened on Torchwood, actually. So what? So it's right, it's still Slash. Now, there's also lesbian Slash, or femme Slash, as we like to call it. Like, say, um, well, you can't see it, but, uh, well, trust me, it's up there. Inara and Kayla from Firefly. Yeah, we got some brand quotes out there, man. Don't you know that Inara, with all of her exquisite companions training, can really get that engineer's engine up and running? Sailor Mercury moaned, her cheeks flushed with embarrassment and rage.
Now, it was the dawn of a new era in 1966. There was no internet, but there were, you know, conventions, fanzines, the U.S. Postal Service, and male and female fans sat down to watch two singular men, a brash new upstart captain and his cool and collected science officer, boldly go where no man has gone before. Mr. Spock. So what was it about these two men that unleashed the homoerotic fantasies of fans all over the world? Perhaps it was the keen pleasure of watching Spock struggle to deal with the dual heritage of Vulcan logic and human emotion. Maybe it was a simple fact of seeing two men actually speak to each other as close friends and confidants without fear of judgment. This was space, after all, the final frontier, and anything was possible. Regardless of reason or logic, the friction between their divergent personalities was fascinating. <laughs> Kirk was the commanding officer, but his knees were weakened when the Vulcan so much as glanced his way. Later that night, he prayed he would find himself on his knees, licking the boot of the man who filled his heart with longing. Spock! Ponfar is a regrettable but necessary release of extreme sexual tension. A Vulcan must be careful whom he trusts when the time of Ponfar is at hand, for nothing will stand in the way of his release. Kirk. To feel Spock's hand on his face, the, the mind meld that brings them together more intimately than any, than any sense of lust, a fisting of the brain and soul, their bodies touching their minds as one. 